Um, and just to reiterate that I wasn't supposed to be giving this talk today, but Vicky Halter seemed to do back badly and I had to step in very last minute. Um, so I haven't had that much time to prepare. So if I look at uh, slides with a very blank face or um, if it's rubbish, then you know why. Um, so be nice to me, yeah, be kind. Um, so just before I start talking about the study that we did on associated difficulties for young people with gender dysphoria, um, I just want to mention our service just briefly, just to set the scene where where the research shall take took place, because some of you might not be familiar with the um, Gender Identity Development Service. So this is the tabby, I don't know, maybe most of you know it, uh, on a sunny day, which is uh, fairly unusual, I guess. Um, and we now have a lead space as well, so there are two centres, one in London and one in Leeds. Um, and these are the people who were involved in the research, so it's Vicky Holt, myself and Michael Dunsford. Um, so um, just a little bit about the Gender Identity Development Service. It was founded in 1989 by uh, Dr. Domenico Dicelli. Um, and it's a national, uh, Dominic, um, Dominic said, it's a national highly specialist gender service covering the whole of the United Kingdom, the NHS. Um, so people travel down sometimes from quite far away um, to come down and see us. Um, it's a multidisciplinary service, so we have um, child and adolescent psychiatrists, child and adolescent um, psychotherapists, social workers, clinical psychologists, trainees and researchers as well, I haven't left anyone out there. Um, we take a sort of holistic approach, um, so we try to engage the whole family and work collaboratively with other agencies such as schools, camps and other specialist services. So we think it's important to look at the young person's whole life really, not just the gender identity. Um, and we don't have a sort of preconceived idea about the paths people should follow or about specific outcomes. Um, so who do we see at the UGRDS? We see young people between the age of 0 to 18 years presenting with difficulties around their gender identity. Um, so some of them identify as transgender and might meet the criteria for DSM-5, so there's a sort of incongruence between their experience and express gender and their assigned gender at birth. And others might be more just unhappy about the gender roles expected by society, and, and so we see a spectrum of people really. Uh, and we also see children of um, transsexual parents as well. And many of the people that we see um, present with associated difficulties, such as low mood, self-harming, and that sort of thing. Um, and it's a very, um, it's a very vulnerable group. Um, so social marginalisation, um, prejudice, and uh, discrimination, um, and sort of internalisation of stigma it is very common, really. Um, and this is partly um, why we wanted to do this study. Uh, so that we could have a better idea of the challenges, challenges that young people who attend our service face. Um, and I think also in society things are changing all the time and it's important to have an up-to-date sort of figure on, on associative difficulties as I know there are some previous studies that looked at this as well. So why is it important to look at associative difficulties? Um, well, I think um, there are many different reasons why it's important. Um, for example, having a good understanding of associated difficulties is important for the sort of clinical management of these young people. Um, it's also important to think about whether the difficulties are second, secondary to GD, gender dysphoria, or clinically separate. So the incongruence between self-perception and the body is likely to lead to distress. However, being discriminated against and marginalized by society can also um, lead to distress. So some of the distress um, in these people might be a direct cause of the gender dysphoria, and, and some of it but it might be more of a cause of the challenges they face in society, really. Um, so having a good understanding of associative difficulties is also crucial in terms of risk assessment. 
um, especially sort of screaming for self-harming and suicidal ideation and that sort of thing. Um, and lastly, some associated difficulties um, may require more specialist input, um, such as in the case of AC that Dr. Lai was talking about just before me, um, and, and these sort of associated difficulties may require more specialist input and engagement <coughs> of other services. Um, so children and adults of duty are vulnerable to other mental health difficulties, and there are often social difficulties present, um, and these associated difficulties can lead to worsening of the presentation, so that's why it's important to look at it. And now moving on to what we actually did, so the aims were to get an overview of the demographic characteristics and associated difficulties in young people with gender dysphoria, or young people referred to our service. Um, so really we wanted to get a snapshot of the lives of these young gender dysphoria people and the sort of challenges they face. So what we did was um, we collected data for all of the new referrals between January, the 1st of January 2012 and 31st of December 2012. And I think there were 304 um, cases referred to our service during this time. However, some of them had to be excluded because, um, for example, they were receiving counselling uh, in relation to having a transsexual parent. Uh, they were, their referral was rejected because of over 18, um, or they were seen at the lead space because of the research team and Vicky Holt being based at the Leeds, um, the London service. Um, it would be tricky to get hold of the files from the lead space, so we decided to just focus on the London um, referrals. <coughs> and so, um, in the end, we uh, had 218 uh, cases in total during that year. And what we did is we, uh, we looked at the, um, the files, so we went through all the referral letters and clinician notes or clinician reports and, and just looked through all the sort of um, family variables and associated difficulties. So these are the variables that we examined. Um, we looked at natal gender, age of young person and time of referral, ethnicity, education status, so whether they were attending school, if they were enrolled, whether they had changed their name. So this is not that they had changed it legally necessarily, but that they used a, a different name. Um, their sexual orientation, um, age of first, gender dysphoric feelings, um, and then family makeup, so whether the parents were still together or divorced or um, where, who they were living with, a number of siblings, um, domestic violence, migration, and this sort of thing. And then other associated difficulties, so um, suicidal ideation, deliberate self-harm, suicide attempts, low mood, eating difficulties, anxiety, psychosis, ASC bullying, um, and <coughs> abuse, etc. Et Um, so, like I said, um, this study was carried out by the GIDS consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist, which is Vicky Holt, a research psychologist, which is myself, and Michael Dunsford, who is assistant psychologist in our service. And we went through, like I said, all the referral letters, clinician notes and reports, um, systematically for all of the 280 cases. So this is quite a, a, big, a big job, really time consuming. Um, and then we had an Excel spreadsheet with all the different variables that we're looking at and it was just a matter of uh, typing in everything, anything that we could find. Um, and then once that had been completed, we converted it onto SPSS, which is a statistical software, and then we analyzed it. So this is what we found. Um, so just starting with the demogra demographics, uh, the mean age at referral was 14 years, standard deviation was 3.08. So the range was five to 17 years, for those referred. Um, so what we can see is the majority really seem to present to our service around the age of puberty really, or towards the end, depending on when you start puberty, but around that sort of time which is interesting, 37.2% um, were natal males and 62.8% were natal females. 
Um, and then moving on to ethnicity, it was not available for 18.80% of the time because it wasn't. I think people can opt out as well of disclosing their ethnicity when they come to our service. Um, so for the remaining um, 80, um, remaining people, 88.7% were um, white British, 2.2% um, black Caribbean, 2.2% <coughs> any other mixed background, um, and it goes on. Um, but majority uh, white, white British. Um, so first, um, looking at age of first gender dysphoric feelings. Um, so this is, this is from, again, from referral letters and clinician notes. Um, so we separated these into three different age categories, so 0 to 6 years, 7 to 12 years, and then 13 to 18 years, just for simplicity's sake. Um, and you can see natal females, 38.3% um, had their first gender dysphoric feelings between 0 to 6 years. Um, natal males, 54.4%, so slightly higher. And then in the 7 to 12 years, 41.1% um, of the NATO females um, and 29.1% of the NATO males. Um, and then it's slightly lower for 13 to 18 years, 20.2% the NATO females and 16.5% of the NATO males. And then um, remembering that the mean age uh, at the age of at the time of referral was 14 years. What we can see is that quite a few of these people have had these feelings for a long time and are actually only presenting to our service much later on. So I think this is important to remember, really. Um, so now moving on to expression of gender identity. 47.8% um, preferred um, we used a different name from the birth name. Again, this is not necessarily legally, but they have chosen another name. And there was a quite big difference between the genders here. So it's 67.2% of the natal females and only 20.8% of the natal males. Uh, and I guess this is maybe interesting to think about. Is this work because it's more accepted for, acceptable for the natal females to address that way, or, or what, we're not sure. Um, and then 54.6% were living in the chosen gender full-time, 69.2% um, were natal females, and 29.2%, so again much lower for the natal males, um, and 9.8% part-time, 6.2% natal females, 16% natal males. Um, and only 35.6% did not live in their chosen gender. Um, yeah. Sexual orientation. Uh, so this this information was only available for 56.7%, so 97 uh, of the people. Um, so for the natal males, 19.2% were attracted to females, 42.3% uh, um, attracted to males. 38.5 uh, bisexual, 0% asexual, and then if we move on to the natal females, 67.6 .6 attracted to females, 8.5% um, attracted to males, 21.1 uh, um, bisexual, and 2.8 um, uh, asexual. Uh, so now moving on to the family features, uh, the mean number of biological siblings was 1.39 and the range was 0 siblings to 8 siblings. 58.3% uh, had separated parents, uh, domestic violence was indicated in 9.2% of the cases, maternal depression in 19.3%, paternal depression in 5%, and parental alcohol and drug abuse in 7.3%. Um, and living arrangements, 37% were living with both biological parents, 31% uh, living just with the mother, and 11.9% living with mother and stepfather, 4.1% living in foster care, 1% uh, were adopted, 
3.2 living with father and stepmother and 1.8% living between mother and father and then the list goes on. I'm not going to disclose because there were loads of different possibilities but these were the, the, the highest percentages really. And now moving on to the associated difficulties. The three uh, main associated difficulties that we found were bullying which was indicated in 47% of the cases, so almost half of them really. Um, and the second one was low mood and depression, which was indicated in 42%. And the third one was self-harming, which is 39%. And again, remembering that this information is only gathered from uh, referral letters and clinician notes and reports, so it's likely to be underreported, if anything. It's, it's quite high, uh, really. So here is the list of other associated difficulties that were looked at. So again, deliver self far and the difference between native to males and females. Um, so for, for self-harm is 25.9% of the native males um, and 46% in the native females, so significantly higher in the native females. Suicidalization, 38.3%, um, 32.8%, so fairly similar natal females. Suicide attempts, also fairly similar between the uh, two, 12.3%, uh, 13.9%. Low mood depression, uh, seems slightly, just slightly higher in the natal males, 45.7%, 39.4% in the natal females. Um, autistic spectrum conditions, so linking to the previous talk, um, it was indicated in 18.5% of the natal males and 10.2% of the natal females. But again, um, this may not always have been a um, proper diagnosis as such, but it was mentioned in the referral letters that they had A and Z. Um, so it's likely to be more of the broader uh, range. Um, and also, I suppose, linking to what Dr. Meyer was saying about um, the Dutch study with the GID um, nose, the GID nose, <laughs> the GID is not otherwise specified. It was 30% in the Dutch sample. So I guess these figures are fairly similar uh, to that number. Um, ADHD, 12.3% natal males, 5.8% natal females. <coughs> And anxiety, 21% um, are natal males, 23.4% natal females, and then psychosis and eating difficulties. And we can see bullying is high um, in both the natal males and the females. And abuse of around 11% natal males and 21% natal females. Um, and then we decided to look at associated difficulties uh, separated into the three age groups that I was talking about before, 0 to 6 years, 7 to 12 years, and 13 to 18 years. Um, if you just have a quick look at the ends, uh, we only have eight people in 0 to 6 um, years age group, so obviously we need to, you know, um, look at these results with, with a bit of caution because some, some of the numbers are quite low and you see the majority of the people are in the 13 to 18 age group. But nevertheless, you can see um, that there was only abuse and anxiety that was indicated in the 0 to 6 years age group. And then um, moving on to 7 to 12 years, um, it seems to increase, most of them, and then moving on to 13 to 18 years, some of them have increased quite drastically, really. So if we look at just the Libra self harm is 15.4%, 7 to 12 years, it's now jumped up to 45.6% in the 13 to 18 enrolls. Similar for suicidal ideation. Um, bullying is quite high in 7 to 12 years as well. Um, and. Um, Depression has uh, jumped up a, a lot as well in the 13 to 18 years. Um, so what this seems to indicate then is that puberty, and we know this, um, is a particularly distressing time for these young people. Um, discussion. Um, so again, the most common um, associated difficulties were found were bullying, um, low mood, depression, and self-harm. 
Um, and if we uh, were to compare these findings to um, a sort of audit done by De Chegui et al. in 2002, <coughs> Um, we find that the percentage of people who were low in mood was the same. So in their study it was 42%, um, whereas the percentage of people who were bullied was lower in their study. So in their study it was only 33% that were bullied. Um, and so was the percentage of people who were self-harmed. So that was 18% in their study, so in 2002. Um, and in ours is 39% so quite a lot higher. It's unclear why this is the case. It's possible that this simply reflects trends in the general population because self-harm, for example, has gone up in the general population in the last um, 10 or so years. Um, so, and then also again, there was a significant difference between natal males and females on self-harming and ASC, so the natal females were found to self-harm significantly more than the natal males, and ASC was more common in the natal males um, than in the natal females. Um, and we also found um, a high incidence of ASC overall, bearing in mind that it's only about 1% in the general population. Um, so we found 18.5% um, in the natal males and 10.2% in the natal females. And this is significantly higher than the study by de Vries et al, um, where they found 7.8%. However, they used the DISCO, the Diagnostic Interview for Social Communication Disorder, which is, um, which is different from obviously looking at referral letters and clinician notes. Um, so it's important to think about puberty, um, so as we can see most of the associated difficulties seem to go up around puberty and clinicians I guess need to be aware of the effect puberty can have on these young people, especially be aware of the risk of, um, of suicide and su um, self-harming. Um, and then also bear in mind the gender differences. Um, so the difference again between self-harming in the natal males and natal females and um, <coughs> ASC in the natal males and, and feeling um, natal females um, and so perhaps sometimes uh, natal males and natal females might require different types of support and interventions um, and then also bear in mind the sort of family environment that we looked at uh, and, and the importance of taking this into account, um, really. Um, and this highlights, um, like I said in the beginning, the importance of having um, a sort of holistic approach and not just looking at the gender identity, but to look at the family environment, the school environment, and everything else, <laughs> really. Um, some limitations are worth mentioning um, is that obviously we looked at referral letters and clinician reports and notes so sometimes there was missing information so, so for example if uh, there was no mention of low mood we assumed that they weren't low in mood this might not be the case it might just be that the clinicians haven't asked about it referrals haven't asked about it or even if they have asked about it they may not have reported it or written it down so again, the, fi the, the figures are likely to be an underestimate, <clears throat> if anything, especially more internalizing type of behaviors like depressions um, um, and maybe self-harming as well, which maybe not everyone's going to report. And, and again, numbers are sometimes low, like I mentioned in zero to six age groups. So to get, um, um, really be able to um, draw some uh, conclusions from this research. We need larger samples, especially if we want to compare the different age groups. Um, and, and again, this study was done at the point of referral, um, so it, it would be really great actually if we can follow them up uh, and see if anything changes over time. You would hope so, if they attend the service for a while, but um, this would be important to do. Um, so conclusions, so many young people with GD present with associated difficulties um, and clinicians need to screen for this really, particularly suicidal ideation um, and self-harming. Um, and clinicians need to uh, be aware that puberty is often a particularly um, 
distressing time for these people. Uh, and also it would be important for clinicians to think about what factors may increase their resilience and strength. And for example, one such factor might be access to a transgender support group and meeting other people in a similar situation. I think this can really increase resilience and strength. Um, so again, it's sort of important to explore other uh, areas of a young person's life. Uh, our society is very heteronormative uh, and predisposed people to uh, isolation, shame uh, and stigma really. So I think this is important to take into account. Um, and again, it's a, a need for services to work collaboratively uh, with some of the associated difficulties such as AZ for example. Um, they might, and self-harm as well, might require input from CAMS or from other more specialist services and so really it's important for people to work together. Um, and more research is needed um, to understand causal links if we can ever get to a point where we can understand the causal links. But again, gender dysphoria could lead to depression for example, but depression could possibly also link to questions or doubts about one's identity in general. So I think it's important to think about that as well. And this is it. <laughs> <laughs>